Okay. So first of all, I just want to welcome everybody. I'm Rabbi Marsha Tilchin, and I'm the founder of the Jewish Collaborative of Orange County. We do programs that sort of uh, bring people together with common interests, originally just locally in Southern California, but after the pandemic nationally. And it's been a great opportunity for um, uh, me to collaborate with some of my great colleagues and friends, not the least of whom is Cantor Matt Ousterklein, a teacher and a friend, someone I've learned so much from and uh, hope to for many, many years. And this is a, this this um, program, the Advanced Learning Institute, is kind of a laboratory for Matt to sort of try out new um, new courses that he might like to teach um, with a with a very friendly, um, you know, engaged audience. And I think this is a new class. Is this a new class for you? Matt? This is an this is a new class for for me and for you. So, uh, well, maybe less for you specifically, Rabbi. But uh, but yes, I'm very excited to, to be uh, learning with everyone here. Okay, so we are we are live on Facebook and we are ready to go. So glad you're all here. All right. Well, welcome everybody from far and wide. Um, this is the uh, the pop culture of prayer, um, and to get us in the mood, um, please put your favorite movie quote in the chat. Take a minute to think about it. And while you're putting your favorite movie quote uh, in the chat from whatever movie it is, as long as it's appropriate for uh, the study of Torah and even tefillah, the study of prayer, um, while you're putting that quote in the chat for everyone to reflect on, uh, I'll do two things. One is that the source sheet for today has been sent in PDF there in the chat, um, both to my via Google Drive and also uh, in direct upload and also on Safari. So uh, the source sheets that we're gonna be looking at today, you can access that way. But let me start by getting us in the mood for prayer with a few movie quotes here and there. All right, we're not gonna do all of these. Can everyone see Robin Williams? Good, all right, let's give it a quick go. I love the smell of my pump in the morning. You're going to need a bigger boat. I feel the need, the need for speed. Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Vargas? We don't need no Vargas. I don't have to show you any stinking Vargas. You make me want to be a better man. Nobody puts baby in a corner. I wish I knew how to quit you. Love means never having to say you're sorry. He's looking at you, kid. I've always depended on the kindness of strange. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Would you be shocked if I put on something more comfortable? You know how to whistle. All right, I'm going to turn that one off because we've got them. We've got all. All right, we've got all that we need for now from those guys. Um, how many of you recognized the majority of the quotes in that run of quotes? Ah, so I can tell that this, uh, this fo uh, our, our esteemed uh, group here is well adapted to the American canon of movies. So why am I talking about canon uh, or movies in a class about tefillah? Um, our, uh, I'm going to talk about this for about three minutes, then we're really just going to dive in and learn because it's like, really going to develop ourselves in terms of how we connect to both uh, the rabbis who formed our prayers and to tefillah itself. So our cultures are defined by canons, right? Um, they really sort of outline the discrete uh, boundaries of text or literature of art or music, um, which define a culture and transmit its way of life. Um, you know, we have all sorts of canons that define the American experience and the Jewish experience and nations and subcultures all have their canons of, of, of art or expression. Um, contemporarily, we know this in pop culture, right? As we just saw from the canon of movies that you all know and uh, which you all uh, were, were a very good job from identifying all the quotes uh, from the, um, the reel. And we have uh, a Casablanca quote here in the chat. What we have here is a failure to communicate. I'll have what she's having, right? There is a, a spirit 
of uh, of an experience of of movies and American culture or pop culture from which people define themselves. And when you quote that thing, it makes you understand what the person is trying to say even deeper, if, at a minimum at the level of a joke, but even beyond that, even beyond that. Even a poor tailor is entitled to some happiness, right? If you were to quote that in a board meeting or something like that, people would, oh, say, I know Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and what does that mean in this context? So if we're going to experience anything together, it's this. That the rabbis of the Talmud and after were nerds. What do I mean by nerds? They were deeply immersed and in a... Uh, a passionate way in the canon of their time. So when they come around to think, how am I going to pray to the Kodesh Baruch Hu, how could they possibly not quote from the canon? It was as if, if I didn't, if I was making prayers and I was, it would be as if I were to say, Luke, I am your uncle. Right? <laughs> For those of you who know Star Wars, you know that's a misquote of the, uh, of the famous Luke, I am your I see some people mouthing father. father. Yes, Luke, I am my father. <laughs> there we go. I don't think it's uh, – by, by, by 2023, I hope that's not a spoiler, but it might be. Um, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? I know people who are not Star Wars people, and that is okay. That is okay. Um, by the way, I, um, I have a, a colleague in Cleveland who teaches at a, a Catholic university. He's a rabbi, and he actually teaches um, – uh, Christians how to understand the way Jews think about the the Bible through Star Wars because originally in Star Wars Luke and Leia were supposed to be uh, a love interest but then the third movie comes and they change them to being twins and so you watch if you've seen the Return of the Jedi you look back and you say oh my goodness this whole kiss and the whole situation is completely colored by the third movie well Jews we read the Hebrew Bible without the third movie but so Anyway, that's more of a pop culture reference to how Christians understand. They have this whole thing which retrojects onto their understanding of, uh, of Scripture. The main point is this. We are going to go today into our very tefillot, and over the course of these next four weeks, into our tefillot, into our prayers, to see what quotables the rabbis were bringing us into as they formed the prayers that we say quite uh, perhaps even uh, sometimes even nonchalantly things that are part of the daily everyday parts of our liturgy and see what movie scenes what references are they making and how does an understanding of that what uh, rabbi ellie confer calls the intertext of uh, the understanding of that intertext how does that reference make us pray differently whose shoes are we supposed to be in uh, for those prayers so that's an introduction to as a, as a, uh, a musical forspice to our section of the day. Let's start with what, the, what we're going to be covering. Please sing along with me if you can, or if, you, if you'd like to. Baruch atah Adoshem, Elokeinu velokei Aboteinu, Elokei Abraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Velokei Yaakov, and be out, of course. Eloke Sara, Eloke Rivka, Eloke Rachel, Eloke Lea, Akel Agadol Hagibor Mehanora, Kelel Yon, Gomel Hasadim Tovim, Vekone Hako, Vezoche Hasde Abut, Ume Vigo Eliv Nevenehem, Le Man Shemobe Ahava, Mevekozer Ufoket, Umoshia, Umagain Baruch Ataha, Adoshem, Magin Abraham, Ufoket Sara. Amen. There you go. Now, usually we get through that in shul in anywhere between 50 seconds or if we are really in the fear in like a weekday Amida, you know, I've got work next, maybe in 15 seconds. But how many illusions do we have in just this one little blessing? This is the Avot. This is the first blessing of the Amida, of which the rabbis say, if you don't say it with intention, it's as if you have, you have to go back. You have to, it's as if you haven't said the Amida at all. This is one of the, the, if you could say, the core blessing of the Amida is the Avot. It is central in Halakha. It is central to understanding of ourselves and as praying Jews. But, so now, let's go to the movies. We're going to start with 
Um, Baruch Atah Hashem Elo Ose Eloheinu Eloheinu Velohe Avotenu Elohe Avraham Elohe Yitzchak Elohe Yaakov. Now, does anyone know what movie this is referencing? Okay, Rabbi, I see Rabbi Marsha has her hand up, but she's a rabbi. She's holding it in. She's holding it in. Anyone else? What part of the, of the Hebrew Bible, of the Torah in specifically, is this referencing? Book of Genesis. The book of Genesis? Where in the book of Genesis? Well, they're all over the place. They start in chapter, the end of chapter 11, and they go straight down to the end of the book. Ah, uh, yes, they are in the book of Genesis. However, the words, Elohe Abraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Elohe oh, Yaakov, is, is a very okay. specific okay. movie okay. reference. It's as okay. specific as Luke, I am your father, or I'll have what she's having. It's that specific. Can, do I have another hand? I had another hand. I thought I saw another hand. Speak up. All right, Rabbi, you've been waiting. Go ahead. Yes, I um, I put my hand up. You oh, yeah. can't see the Mer little... Yes, Kentaro Koshi. Almost can't Kentaro Koshi. The... It's a... Oh, yes, you can't see the hand icon. Well, I'm cheating. I looked at your source sheet. Okay. It's the it's at the burning bush. It's in Exodus. Um, Very well. good. And in fact, we have an actual movie I can show you. It You can make your opinions about it. But of course, every pace... Ten Thank Commandments. You, Koshi. But that's the yes for the movie I'm going to show you is the Ten Commandments. If I have the honor of bringing it up, um, yes, there it this is, is. This is just from so, but this is from um, Exodus chapter three. I'm Exodus through. chapter three. Yes, 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 yes. All right. So if you'll just wait a second, I'm gonna pull up this wonderful movie clip for us all to watch, so we can get even get. A, it a might sense be in the, Prince of Egypt as well. <laughs> it it is in fact in Prince of Egypt. All right, you guys ready? Can you see uh, Charlton Heston of Blessed Memory? Raise your hand. Can you hear? Yes. We're gonna watch about two and a half minutes. Of this. It's because God's I'm here. What are the shoes from off thy feet? For the place where our God stands is holy ground. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Lord, Lord, why do you not hear the cries of their children in the bondage of Egypt? I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. Therefore, I will send thee, Moses, unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring my people out of Egypt. Who am I, Lord, that you should send me? How can I lead this people out of bondage? What words can I speak that they will heed? I will teach thee what thou wilt say. When thou hast brought forth the people, they shall serve me upon this mountain. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now therefore go, and I will be with thee. But if I say to your children that the God of their fathers has sent me, they will ask, what is his name? And how shall I answer them? I am that I am. Thou shalt say, I am hath sent me unto you. There we go. So now from the... Uh, uh the classic in a way and by the way that was cecil b demille's second time making the ten commandments did you guys know this 
He made it in his youth in the 1920s as a, as a silent film. Silent movie, right. As a silent movie. And then it was actually about okay. the first half was the story in the Bible. And then the second half was about a guy who decided to break all the Ten Commandments. And it was a, a morality play about how those who break the commandments, you know, the commandments shall break them. It was very, you know, uh, a, kind of going back against the Roaring Twenties. So the main point is this. The back, the intertext, the hyperlink of the entire uh, that little quote Elohei Abraham Elohei Tzchaf Elohei Yaakov is exactly as we've seen to the scene of the burning bush. Now, let's take a minute and before we look at our text itself to think about what implications does that have for the person who is praying. It gives you standing to pray. That's the basic point. We stand before God. Christians kneel. Muslims prostrate themselves. How do we have the nerve to stand before God? Answer, were the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of whom stood before God. As it says, Abraham, Asher, Ahmad, Shammah, and Hashem. So here we have, and there is, by the way, uh, Yehudi is correct, in the text, uh, as we'll see in, in Exodus and Shemot, that there is a, uh, an, uh, you, know, you, know, excuse me, you know, take your shoes off from the ground which you stand, right? Moshe is, it, despite what Charlton Heston is doing, Moshe in the Torah is in the stand, initially in a standing posture when it comes to God. Um, so we could we have that we have that connection that it is in the name of the Avot that we in his name our ancestors that we have merit before God. Um, that's that's certainly one thing we can take away from this hyperlink. Re what else might we feel Rhea. from knowing from feeling ourselves into this scene? Rhea? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I had in my mind what I would do with that recording of the movie. I'd put a voice, God's voice, neither male nor female, but in a range that could be interpreted as either woman or man, because God is neither in our concept. The other thing is uh, the God of Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob was leaving, leaving out all the women. And as a woman, I have always, so the conservative movement, the reform movement has put in Sarah, Rebecca, and Leah. To include so they represent humanity. Rachel. Don't forget Rachel. I did. Yeah, I did. So, so that represents humanity, um, and uh, that uh, that that there's um, I'm that, and, and it's a lineage type of a thing that lineage counts. So there's a lot of um, stuff in those just few words. So you, so you have humanity, but not all humanity. You have a certain lineage. Yeah. May, may, I, Rabbi, please. may, I, may I just share something? You know, it's so interesting. I, I, I'm not as entertaining as Matt Ousterklein, but for many, many years um, when I was a synagogue professional, I, I actually broke down the prayer book for people. I taught many classes on prayer. No expert, but certainly covering the highlights, not the least of which was the Amida. And of course, I showed where these quotes came from. I had a source sheet, whatever. And early on in about 99 and 2000, really 99, 98, when the conservative movement was having the conversation about whether to include the Imahot, that's what made me think about this, Rhea, is, you know, some of us, including yours truly, was originally, I changed my mind, but I was originally against it, not because I was against including the four mothers or recognizing in them some way, but it would it would it would have been a bastardization of the Torah text that this was quoting directly. The women were not mentioned, you know, in, in that moment. So the and I think ultimately the way it's phrased, at least in in you know in the final redaction of the conservative liturgy, is that it's almost like an insert. It's that they, they insert the women, but but the integrity of the original um, scriptural text maintains. And I think anytime they've made additions like that in, the, let's say, the last 60 years, that has been on their mind. And maybe Cantor Ausklein will be, you know, talk about that more. But I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Rabbi. I, I really appreciate that. That, you know, 
Let's think about any other nerd in any other context, right? When you misquote something from your favorite movie, what do they do? They say, no, 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 it, that's not it. it. It's not what it says. That's not what the author wrote, right? It's not, you're a warlock, Harry. It's, you're a wizard, Harry. Or it's not, you know, it's, this is what, this is what it is. You can totally, if you have nerd children or grandchildren, or if you have a nerd place in your heart yourself, you can totally understand how misquoting Casablanca, right? It's just not the movie. It's just not the movie. So some of the resistance to the Imaho has nothing to do with egalitarianism. It has to do with, it's not the movie. And one of the responses at that time was that in Israel, they did, a, or not in Israel, um, Rabbi Danny Nevins, I think, if I'm not, if I'm, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, at GTS, at the Conservative Seminary in New York, wrote a little piyut that was authentic with quotes about the Imahot that actually quoted their stories in the Torah um, authentically and as they were expressed in scripture. And so, um, you know, that's uh, the, one of the, so one, just one of the things to see about, about the Imahot is that, uh, leaving them out is it, it, I, I do them in all of my Amidot. I happen to, um, but it's more about what is the actual text and what is, what is that putting, what kind of place is that putting us into? So we're going to get a little deeper into that. I have, um, I have a question. I have a, a comment from, uh, Cantor Schwartz, and then I'm going to ask a question about Moshe, who's our, our main character here. Cantor Schwartz. So I trying to formulate this in an intelligent manner. It seems that, yes, I understand everything that Reb Marsha said. I understand everything the way you summarized it. But having lived through this and being one of the handful of the class of JTS 1980 that was literally out there protesting at the top of our voices so that our elder teachers could hear us through the thick brick walls of JTS to let the women in to first rabbinical school and then our cantorial school, that um, there's a greater good. I Believe me, I, I one reason I'm planning on being on all four of your classes, even if I have to move my whole schedule around to do so, is because I want to learn from you um, some of the details of where the quotes come from in our liturgy from the Torah. I have a sense of many of them, but I've already learned things from you in the first 15 minutes of your class. But this is one where I'm going to say, I'll go with the greater good of including some version of the females and having finished after six conservative synagogues, finishing my career in reform, I got a little taste of the way they did it for three years. But, um, it's just unconscionable at this point to not include the female because for one thing, we've got so many female colleagues, a couple of whom are right here on this call with us. I, I agree with you, Cantor Schwartz. And I certainly, the emo have been, um, I, and I say this in a positive way, they've been politicized as part of representing um, egalitarianism in a way that's very, that's incredibly desirable. Um, that's absolutely true. So this is not a class about how we should get the Imahot out of the liturgy. Um, this is just uh, a, a, just putting a little focus on where that specific quote comes from and the story that comes through it. So to get deeper into that, I want us to think about, because these are the words, Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov, who is saying these words and to whom in the scene? Let's think about the movie. Who is saying the words and to whom? God is saying them to Moses. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ruth. God is saying these words to Moshe at the scene of the burning bush. Now let's think, what is Moshe Rabbeinu? Tell me about his life up until that point. What do we know about Moshe Rabbeinu up until the point of the burning bush? Yes, Ruth. Well, he he was uh, set afloat in a in a boat of reeds. reeds. The uh, Egyptian princess found him, gave him back to Yocheved to nurse him and raise him. Then he went to live in the Pharaoh's palace. And I think at this point he's killed the uh, he's killed the uh, overseer who was beating the Hebrew. And I get the feeling that he was stumbling around at this point, and suddenly God started to talk to him. Did I leave anything yes. out? 
Leave um, did did Ruth leave anything out? Anyone want to throw anything else in that's important yeah, about besides, Hashem Yehudi? Uh, besides murdering the Egyptian taskmaster, he's also tried to uh, mediate in a dispute between two Hebrews, and uh, you know they pretty much threw him out. And the next thing that happens is he runs into the daughters of Jethro, who are trying to get water by a well, but they're not doing too well with that either. Because it comes from bullies come along and push them away. Moses beats up the bullies, and the girls go home. Excuse me, the women go home, and um, then they their father their father Jethro says to them, "Why don't you invite the man who saved you home?" And sure enough, they go invite him, and before you know it, Moses is married to one of Jethro's daughters, and he's already had at least one son by her. Maybe two. It isn't exactly clear at this point whether it's one or two. And uh, and now he's become a shepherd for you, Jethro. So you get the feeling that he's been shepherding for a good 40 years or so before the God appears to him at the burning bush. But one of the grounds where he shepherds is the area where of Sinai, of Horeb, called in that time. Very good. So Yehudi got us up to speed on a lot of other parts of the story. Indeed, Moshe Rabbeinu is the one misleading thing about the Ten Commandments. There are others, um, especially uh, Moses quoting the book of John um, when he throws the tablets. Those who shall not live by the law shall die by the law. That's from the book of John. So, But go figure. Uh, <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille knew his other Bible as well, his Hindu Testament. Main point is this. Moshe Rabbeinu is 80 years old. He is not this nice, you know, uh, brown-haired, you know, overgrown, beard-looking, you know, 40- or 50-year-old uh, like he is with Charlton Heston. You know, he's not he's not athletic. He's uh, married, you know, he's already had a whole life. He's had a whole life. Uh, and how would we describe Moshe's life before he meets God? If you had to use uh, just a, two, a couple just simple adjectives. He's a shepherd. He's directionless. Privileged. Well, so he's wait. Been, a, he's he, been he, privileged, he, maybe. He's, he's been on the wanted list. And his pictures in every post office in Egypt wanted for murder. He's uh, got, yeah, he's, privileged. he's got, he's, he's running. Lived, he's running from he, his past. He's on he the lived, run. He, lived, he started he out a as a privileged character. He, he lived in a palace. He was part mm -hmm. of the upper echelon the, or the aristocracy of Egypt. It's also unclear so, if he knew how much he identified with the children of Israel. I mean, he was raised, he might have been taught by his mother, but, you know, did he connect or did he need to be told, you know, I'm talking to you, you're in this, you're in this tradition, you're in this lineage. Absolutely. Because the first thing he does as an adult is murder that Egyptian taskmaster. I mean, that's the end of his palace life, and he knows it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll cut in only to say that I, it, while it, it, you, one can, one absolutely can make a case that Moshe is very connected, at least to uh, some sense of tzedek or justice, whether it's to his people. Uh, you can argue in in uh, in Ab in saving the Hebrew and and trying to make peace, or in general, he's he's oriented towards justice in you know in helping to save the 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 Midianite shepherdesses from their from the the guys who are trying to push them out and get their water and that their um their livestock watered um but he's uh you can, he's a, an ex aristocrat hothead um who you know loves to, he wants to do the right thing ambiguous his connection to his people maybe strong maybe weak and this is the first time he has ever spoken that we know of the first time he has ever spoken to God, when he's 80. So there's the question that comes, as prayers, what, what opportunities for us in being in the place of Moses in the moment of prayer, what opportunities for, how might we feel in that moment when filling Moshe's shoes? What feelings might we be able to access if we're accessing that story? Awe. Okay. Sorry. Awe. A W E. 
I heard awe from Karen Schwartz. Yes. Fear. Fear. Those are like, Jewishly, those are so close, right? Awe and fear. My grandson would say awesome. There is a big wow moment, right? Certainly Moses turns aside. I'd also add that we're not, we're, that when we're in the Amidah, the first scene that we're taken to is of somebody who is very far from their people, right? This is not a, uh, a pious Rebbe. Uh, this is not the Moses of Yismach Moshe, right? This is not the Moses that is uh, the one who brings the law down. This is the sort of disconnected, intermarried Moses that is far, physically and perhaps even spiritually far from his people. And he is getting re-engaged in that moment of prayer. So again, the the opportunities for our own hearts of coming in thinking like, oh, I have to be in this great moment. Whatever the, all the shoulds of our tefillah is if we're seeing ourselves in Moses' shoes, the opportunities to interpret what that means for us personally are actually quite wide. And they were for, for the rabbis as well. Now, remember, we know that Moshe Rabbeinu isn't very um, uh, excited or, or enthused about his mission. He says, why are you asking me, right? I'm 80 years old. I have this whole life. Why are you coming and finding me, you know, a, couple, a, couple, a, whole, a whole, I've moved out of town already, you know, you know, I don't speak well. You know, there's a sense of vulnerability and, and questioning that in that space, right? So again, I just some have a basic yeah, question to ask you. Yes, Yehudi. You're a and then I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, just say, "Oh, hey, Abraham, oh, hey, Yisrael, oh, hey, Yaakov," thing is intended to be to to put us at the foot of the of the burning bush, and as a quote from Moses. But I could say it doesn't mean that at all. It simply means that you know statements if if they're intending to focus on a source of the statement. I, in front of actually, they usually use a term like Benam or, or Kakatum. If they just quote it without such an introductory word, then they're just simply using a, a, a verse from scripture to authorize what they themselves want to say. I don't necessarily think when I have a one essay that I'm situating at the verdict bush. I don't think that at all. I basically think that I, I'm, I'm exactly what that that phrase describes, which is this, you know, the, the, the descendant of the ancestors, and these are the ancestors. In fact, that's one of the reasons I say you have no problem saying Elohei Rachel, because they also prayed to God. And for each one of them, you can find the passage which said that either they prayed or that God listened to their prayers. So I really consider myself the descendant of seven people, not three. And when I say that, though, I don't think about the burning bush at all. I mean, all that that quote does for me is somebody put it all together and it's first mentioned there. But the fact that it's first mentioned there doesn't, it's now become a quotable quote. You can put it wherever you want to put it, unless you're trying to focus on a burning bush, which clearly this one ashtray is not. Well, I'll, I'll I'll take that Yehudi, you are a true Pashtan at heart, and uh, oh, you yes, know I the uh, the whatever it says, that's it. And you're if and we are welcome to pray the uh, the Amida without reference to the context. However, I'll be sorry to say my class is pretty much entirely about all the other non Pashtanic stuff, the the emotional and resonances of the text in the literature themselves. So, without further ado, I am going to share my screen. Um, into the source sheet that I put together. And I want to give uh, Hakara Hatov first to, uh, to God, um, because uh, that's what this is all about, our ability to connect to better to God through understanding of, of how the rabbis are setting us up in prayer, uh, but also to Rabbi Eli Confer. Uh, a lot of the sources here I have taken um, from his doctoral work, which is on intertextuality, the interaction between the prayers and their source material in the Hebrew Bible and Hebrew scripture, and uh, and indeed how Chazal, how the, our, the rabbis themselves understood this material uh, in that context as well. So we've gone through a lot of what of this opening source. I didn't get to go through it because you guys know it pretty well. And we saw the we saw the movie, but you should read the book too. <laughs> 
Um, the only thing to add from up here, uh, from verses 15 to 17 in Exodus 3, is that um, Moshe once, uh, he says in, in verse 15, and then we're, um, if a reader will come forward for the Midrash coming below, uh, I would welcome that if you want to read. Um, but I'll read the source, uh, verse 15 in uh, Exodus 3. Uh, Shem says further to Moses, uh, Thus shall you speak to the Israelites, Adonai, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. And this shall be my name forever and my appellation for all eternity. And, and he says again, go and assemble uh, the elders of Israel. Go and assemble them. Uh, right. The God of your, take all the leaders and say to them, this exact name has taken note to you in Egypt. Uh, and I have declared, I will take you out. Um, so this is not just a, a name of re-engagement with Moshe as it is. And we can feel the feelings that perhaps we can imagine the different possible feelings that Moshe Rabbeinu is having in this moment at the burning bush. But God says, this is also the name that I want you to tell everyone about when you are on mission to help this mission of bringing them out of slavery. So it's a name that's invoked when God is coming to uh, to bring new possibilities, new freedom, um, uh, bring a Torah way of life to the Jewish people who have been not not doing that for a long time because they've been in slavery. So again, it's you could even call it an invocation of of liberation, of moving from whatever uh, whatever avdut one is in, whatever slavery one is in, towards cheirut, towards towards freedom. Now, let's take a look at how the rabbis who were watching this movie a lot thought of this scene. Can I get a reader for the English of the Tanchuma Shemot? Will the reader manifest for the Tanchuma Shemot? I'll volunteer. I'll read. Okay. Oh, go ahead, ladies first. Oh, you go ahead. Go ahead, Kendra. He said, I am the God of your father. God revealed himself in the voice of Amram, his father, so that Moshe would not fear. At that moment, Moses was overjoyed and said, Amram, my father lives. God said to him, you said that I am your father. I am none but your father's God. At that moment, Moses hid his face. Wow. So if, what is this Midrash? What is this Midrash telling us about Moshe's experience of, uh, of that moment? Yes, Rhea. I, I think it's so, interesting. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Oh, okay. So uh, that the rabbis, I'm, this is what I'm thinking. The rabbis understood that God was not a human. And God, having a human voice the way God did in with Carl, Carl, Carlton Heston, whatever his name is. So they now twist it so that God can perform as if he were god was i shouldn't say he but if, that if god was a human so already they're recognizing in this small little story that that you can't you don't uh what do you call it uh, give god human qualities that's how i interpret it beautiful so you know philosophically we're understanding here Rhea is pointing out that um even the rabbis know that God doesn't have a voice. God is is creating some sort of, of construction of voice in order to connect to Moshe. It doesn't mean that God has a deep voice, you know, like in the, the stereotypes. Um, it's just God is constructing this voice in a way to connect to Moses. And he connects in through, because it says, it says, I am the God of your father. He uses, uh, you know, he, he does, actually, we'll get to the other source where it says he really uses that voice specifically. Ruth, go ahead. So if Moses is 80 years old and he may have lived with his parents, Amram and Yochev, until he was about three or four, A, he has a very long memory, and B, obviously the voice of his father was something that he never, ever, ever forgot, even though it's 77 years later and he has may not have heard it. Absolutely. So this is, you know, really pointing to perhaps the the 
the long, you know, we don't really hear a lot about Amr. We hear about Yochebed, we hear about Miriam. And the book of, of Shemot is very filled with women's voices. It's very filled with women uh, being part of this liberation story. But we don't hear much from Amram. We a certain each, you know, Levi, you know, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, these, this Levite family has a kid. Um, and so maybe, you know, we, there's this sense, and we're going to see in this next source of, of Moshe longing for this fatherly connection to this parent who is not, you know, at least as far as the Torah shows us, is not very present. It's not very present. So it really just deepens in some way the, the pathos of Moshe Rabbeinu in this moment. I'm going to move on to the next source, but Yehudi, a quick comment. You're muted, Yehudi. Does ever say that God was his father? I'm sorry? The Holocaust seems to assume that Moses said that God was his father and God's going to enlighten him. No, I'm not your father. I'm the God of your father. I have no recollection of Moses ever saying that God was his father. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah. So the Midrash comes... It's saying that the Midrash, of course, it's not in the, if you're looking for the, the simple Pshat, Rashi even tries to give you the uh, the simple Pshat of Midrash, but of course this is Midrash. And the Midrash is that uh, the reason for the text, Elohei avi, Ani Elohei, uh, Elohei Avicha, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, Isaac, and, Jacob, and Yaakov, is, is that, that, why does it say that? Because Hashem came in the voice of his father. Of course, it doesn't say that Hashem is his father, um, but again, the, the Midrash is coming to explain, why does it say he came in the call of his father. He came in the voice of his father. But of course, the uh, the jig is up, and and uh, and uh, Moshe is filled with in that midrash is filled with emotion, and then hides his face and explains why he hides his face because he had been filled with emotion. I'm going to see it's my hey, is my father alive? Hey, but but that's not you know necessarily what's going on. Can I get a second reader for the Shemot Rabbah, um, which is another expansion of. Uh, of how God's God's theophany, God's theophany to Moshe, and what Moshe is feeling in this moment. Can I get a different reader? A volunteer to unmute and read. I'll read. Please, thank you so much. Rabbi Hoshea, Hoshua Hakohen, son of our. Nehemiah said, at the time God revealed himself to Moses, Moses was a novice in prophecy. God said, if I reveal myself with a great voice, I will frighten him. In a small voice, he will not respect prophecy. What shall I do? He revealed himself in the voice of his father, Amram. Moses said, what does my father want? God said to him, I am not your father, but rather the God of your father. I came to you in seduction so as not to frighten you, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Moses was overjoyed and said, my father is counted among the patriarchs, and not only that, but he is great, and he and is mentioned first. Hmm. So Sandra, could you summarize that for us? What is, uh, what is Moshe's great, uh, what, what is the, the, the key that, of, of what Moshe is understanding in this moment? Well, I think that actually it's more about what God is saying to him. He didn't want to come and frighten him with a voice that he didn't know. He wanted to make him more comfortable so he would listen to him. And so he used the voice of his father. And, and uh, Moses, on the other hand, is overjoyed because his father, which he didn't realize was maybe such a big guy, is counted among the patriarchs, which is a, a great honor. Beautiful. Beautiful. It sort of goes to you know, expands upon Yehudi's earlier point that not only is it I have I have you know ground to stand on that will have my you know these are the God of my ancestors, but Moshe personalizes I, when when God says Anuchi Elohe Avicha, I am the God of your specific your father, meaning in this context your specific father. And Moshe, this guy, eighty years old after this this harrowed career of, of uh, justice activism possible criminal activity and and uh, uh ambiguous connection with his people saying really my dad he's number one oh that's uh, that's meaningful to him Ruth, okay please. i i i disagree a little bit please First please well i think that these uh, midrash is like fan fiction 
They're like <laughs> filling in yeah. all the stuff that they want. You really want to know about your celebrities, you know? So I think that God says, I came to you, you know, in, the, in I'm not your father, but the God of your father. But I don't, I think Moses misreads it and he elevates Amram to Abraham, God, Isaac, and Jacob. And I don't think that's what God intended at all. <laughs> I appreciate that, Ruth. Right. You are, by the way, I, I, I'm not the I only completely Pashtun identify there. with your, uh, your, uh, yeah. yes, you're not the, he's not, you're not the only Pashtun Yehudi. Yes, I, you, you think, I, and by the way, I have long felt that Midrash is rabbinic fanfic. I think that is a very, uh, uh, a powerful comparison because they love this so much and need to fill in all these gaps, right? What happened to this part? What happened in this? What happened in this? You know, it's like the Marvel universe, you know, Marvel universe spin out of every single possible character. I love it when you see Safaria and you, you know, and it's up here and it's Torah and there are some words that are bold faced. And you know, those are the only words that really appear in the text, but the other stuff is kind of added so that it makes a little sense. So I kind of think the Midrashim are trying to bring all of this elevated stuff so that that so I can understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, the 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 sort of fanfic effect is not that this is, you know, it's like how we say, um, you know, uh, gosh, there's, there's all sorts of things people take that are Midrash. They think, oh, this is in the Torah, but it's really, you know, Midrash. Like when God holds Mount Sinai above the people or whatever. There are other there are other such uh, Midrashim that people think is Torah. But the opportunity is to connect with from, I would say, dare I even say subjectively. And I mean, an Orthodox rabbi of a certain character would not say subjectively. They would say, this is all Mishamayim. Um, but to experience what was it like to be in Moshe's shoes. And here... There is perhaps a perhaps nurse you could uh, if uh, Ruth might say a narcissistic personalization of a halavia right I am the god of your father uh, that uh, he's taking it to a, a very personal place where this is really his father it's not in a a generalized setting um, but again these are just two different ways that uh, that the rabbis are understanding that scene and indeed that we too at prayer um, if we're open to a, a non uh, a non pshat approach, which is a totally legit way to pray, um, we might be welcomed into a sense of you know um, this. Uh, the, um, I am addressing, you know, I am praying to the God of my my very own father, who is part of of Abraham, Abraham Yitzchak, Yaakov, or the God of my mother, of, or of a parent of mine um, that I am in that lineage too, and it's actually quite personal and not as distant as it feels, or as it might otherwise feel. So with our last, oh my goodness, could you believe we spent about 40 minutes on one source and I have three more. I'm going to get briefly, briefly so that you can, if you can feel like you're in the, uh, the burning bush, um, for the, for the first, uh, for the first part of the Amidah, let's at least get you, uh, into one more scene. Uh, let's get into one more scene. Uh, so let's go to, uh. Uh, God Almighty. And uh, can I get a reader, someone who hasn't spoken before, that would be super helpful, just to read um, 12, Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 19. Can I get uh, 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 someone who hasn't read yet? Rosalie, Susan, would one of you read? Uh, Rosalie, you're, I see you reading, but you're muted. I'm happy to read it. Don't ask me to do a praises on it. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now, O oh Israel, what does your God, <clears throat> Adonai, demand of you? Only this, to reverse your God, to walk only in divine paths, to love and serve your God with all your heart and soul, keeping Adonai's commandments and laws, which I enjoin upon you today for your good. Mark mark the heavens to their uttermost reaches belong to your god the earth and all that is in it yet it was to your ancestors that adonai was drawn out of love for them so that you their lineal descendants were chosen from among all peoples as is now the case cut away therefore the thickening about your hearts and stiffen your necks no more <clears throat> for your God is God supreme and Lord supreme, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, 
who shows no favor and takes no bribe, but upholds the cause of the fatherless and the widow and befriends the stranger, providing food and clothing. You too must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You can leave um, it right there. Thank you. So okay. well, there's more to come, but but thank you yeah. so much. I appreciate that. I, I just have a question quickly. Um, Please. Why is why is Adonai spelled differently with, a, uh, I guess, a kof? The uh, the intention here is, is and I, I apparently the, the converter in Safari, I missed one, is that when you print it out, you don't want to have something that has God's name on it. Um, so that you don't have to bury it in the Geniza. That's the, the, the purpose of it. So uh, the, oh, the PDF that you have, if you print it out, it has one Shemot. I'm sorry. I didn't get to, to give the second look after I put it through the converter. Um, but that's that's why it's good, k Oh, there, I have one of... more question just quickly. Please, Rosalie. Um, it, it, with the, um, the prayer to the fathers and it, the, our ancestors, in the Orthodox, does it include women now or no? No, I, I don't believe there is not a specific um, invocation of uh, of the Imahot in, in, in okay. I think, any Thanks. Orthodox prayer book that I know. I didn't even think in, so. In the, in the okay. side, even in the, the liberal side of YCC or uh, uh, or some other, that's, I think, yeah, that's all. Um, and so this is the context of Ha'ekel, Ha'gadol, Ha'gibor, Ve'hanora. You can see in verse 17, um, which comes right after the scene of Moshe. What is this scene? What is what is uh, what is Deuteronomy ten? Either a I, I a tell me what it is, or b what is the bigger context of what this where this verse is talking? What this verse is talking about? Can I just say one thing? I just Please. was studying this morning. We we're, we're doing Torah line by line, and we we just did this whole thing. With the uh, the you know, the fatherless and the widow, we just this was what we were just reading. But you know, it's interesting because Deuteronomy is the, what the last book before they yes. crossed over, and this one we always think about it as last week on Homeland. I mean, it's the summary of everything, and it's the re it's like you know you've been wandering around for forty years, and now you're about to enter, and let's go over all the stuff I taught you. So this is like a recap. Yeah, this is a big, this is Devarim. This is Moshe's graduate, you know, charge to the Jewish people. If we had God speaking to Moshe in the first source, in the burning bush, beginning, you know, six words or 10 words of the Amidah. Now the next five, you know, next six words, we have Moshe at the end of his career talking to B'nai Israel, talking to the Jewish people. Um, so there are both of these, as as uh, Rabbi Confer points out, all of these first three, and if you get a chance, because we're coming to the end of our time, if you get a chance to look at, at the further in the source material, everything included here, which is Hakel El Gadol Gibor Benora, El Elyon, and the end, Baruch Atah Hashem, Magin Abraham, those are all things that are are consistent in the Talmud as part of what the essence of the Avot blessing is. Uh, other things uh, Rabbi Confer points out in his, his PhD work are there are ma wide variants um, in uh, the medieval tradition and all the traditions of Sidurim uh, of different Jews of what goes in the middle, you know, the Konea Vizorcher Chaste Avot, Dume Vigo El Mine Nehen, Machuobi Ava. Those are all much more ver uh, of a variant than these core things which come from the Talmud. So, um, so here we have Deuteronomy. We have this, you know, this big speech. Um, what strikes you about our verse here, about verse 17? Um, how does this, how does seeing this in context change the way you understand? Does the, does the context deepen in any way, the, the words for you, um, in terms of what, what they, they are indicating? Susan or Robert? Robert, you're talking about your. Would you be on mute? Yes, I'm. I, I'm. I'm not sure exactly how. What more precisely what you're asking? Thank you for inviting a response, but I'm not sure what I'm responding to. Oh, does the does the what does the broader what is there anything interesting about the broader context of this of this verse that gets put in the in the prayers? Anyone? 
I'm still reacting to what you did earlier, so it may be that I haven't cleared my head enough, but I'll That's try okay. to leave it alone. That's There's okay. almost There's... no time left, but I had a very oh. strong response to stuff earlier, so Good, but I'll, if I come up with enough. anything in the next 120 seconds, I'll let you know. <laughs> That's fine. Susan, did you want to say something? Um, it just seems that um, the God being portrayed has taken on greater um, responsibilities and uh, activities and has almost become more human. Yeah, there's a more of a, of a, a sensitivity to humanity going on here. And the rabbis talk about it in that um, <laughs> whenever God's... Um, this is the humility of God. Whenever his greatness is talked about, his chesed is talked about, his love is talked about. So here, in the context of Ha'el HaGadol HaGibur HaNora, God is so big and huge, right? This is caricature of big God, powerful. The next thing is he doesn't take a favor, he favors and no bribes and protects the vulnerable, right? So that when we're talking to God, it's not this we're talking to this big, unaccessible you know, oh Lord, it's like a Monty Python sketch from this. That's my canon. Oh, oh, you're so very huge, God. Gosh, we're all really impressed down here. I can tell you, right? It's not just the bigness of God. It's that the power points to doing good. That the power points to helping the vulnerable, and that that is the next thing in our. When we're saying this prayer, that might be the next thing in our mind is that this is a God. That when Moshe is saying this, he's reminding us that this God can't be bribed when we're talking to him. He actually is really interested in protecting the vulnerable. Yes, Ria. Well, so, so I, you know, it's it's interesting that uh, we're we're humanizing, but uh, and making God into a caring um, supreme of being and yet the slavery of the hebrews for all those years and the, then when you get to the book of joshua the genocides that go on is that uh you know obviously either different uh, the writers have different concepts or they're trying to clean up the image they it, it, to reconcile a really powerful um in a sense, cruel God, and then trying to soften this. So, and I'm uh, I'm assuming they're different writers with trying to put in different ideas, but it doesn't. Uh, there's an um, uh, an incon There's a lot of inconsistencies. But that's just the whole point. The first I'll, paragraph. I'll let uh, I'll let I see some hands. So I'll let. Uh, uh, so I'll just reflect back to you, Rhea, that, that that I hear that there's for you there's a block between this uh, caring God and then the God that that is encouraging Yehoshua uh, in the conquest of the land, and I totally understand that, um, Robert, and then Ruth. Yeah, I, I'm. I guess I don't entirely under, understand it, Rhea, to be honest, because for one thing, unless I'm missing something, please let me know. Can't imagine if I am. This quotation is from Devarim. It's from Deuteronomy. This is not Correct. Midrash. So it's not we're trying to make God seem more caring. Um, this is the Torah and God himself speaking in a, in a gentler voice than at other times. But this is at least as much the God of the Torah and of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob as God speaking a, a little bit more, I don't know, portentously or something. But this is not our, I mean, Midrash is, is entirely obviously a, a, a valid response to Torah, but this is not Midrash. This is not our adding to it. Um, but these are humans, aren't these humans that wrote this? And so when so, they're different... Well, if you have, if you start from that basis, uh, so okay, fact. but that that's I'll, a pretty... I'll, yeah. Oh yeah, I appreciate yeah, no, that, I... Ria and Robert. I'll I'll say what yeah. side swipe the question of authorship today. We could talk a little about tomorrow, but even at just let's look at it as literature, as even at the basic point of being literature, uh, of being an illusion. I so I, I appreciate that that Robert and Ria perhaps come from from different standpoints on on the the question of of uh, of what the authorship means in this context. Ruth, uh, for the last word, and then I'll I'll close up with this. Very very quickly. I mean, this bold faced. Uh, portion 
is to show the power of God. And then yet, I mean, he's multifaceted. It's not just somebody who's going to be up there exerting power. He get he will get involved. I mean, this is the God that didn't do anything for 400 years while the people were crying as slaves. Maybe he learned his lesson. And now he's going to remember that he's got to take care of these people, you know, in a in a more fatherly like way. Yes. So perhaps the invocation here, one could feel in prayer um, by using uh, this Pasuk, Ha'el HaGadol Gibor Ben Ha'anora, is invoking that really, God, what we really need you for is these acts of, of kindness and for you, you, God, to do them and for us to do them uh, as well, for us to be do, doing these mitzvot as well, um, that this is a, a different time in if you're you know read like jack miles a biography of god uh this is sort of a different time in god's personality development if you if you if you hold uh and they do that's right well, when we get to give a road which we won't i i we could no, spend about uh, several semesters on on all of this material um well, we're coming to the end. I encourage you to go uh deeper into the sources there is our sources there for um uh, the there are uh, are later uses of Hayal Gadol Gibor Venora in scripture in Hebrew scripture in the books of Daniel and Ezra and uh, Nehemiah, um, which belie sort of an experience of God's power after the experience of destruction. So if we were talking about being in the the debt in the slaves for four hundred years, which God tells Abraham, hey, it's going to happen, and it does. Um, that's a saying of God's invoking God's power after a profound experience of destruction and pain. Um, and that's how that's still invoked in 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 a more complex way uh, in other books. And then yeah, there's the other two sources uh, uh, there for uh, for El Elyon, which is uh, uh, and the painting, which I can explain. Well, I'll probably explain the painting next time we meet. But next time we meet, we're going to do a little bit in the Shema. Uh, but I'll try to wrap up a little bit of today's Amida text. And I want to thank you for coming and studying. And I hope that this deepens your engagement with those first moments uh, of of the Amida that we do so often. Thank you very much. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes of questions, and but please email me. You can email me at mattosterkline at gmail.com for any ex more extended uh, thoughts you have that you'd like to share. I'll turn you it over to Rabbi Tilshin. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for coming. What What's our topic next week? Next week, we're going to look at the, uh, the themes of the Shema and the biblical intertext that under and the changes to those biblical intertexts that underlie how the rabbis experience creation, um, revelation, and redemption uh, in the uh, in the text surrounding the Shema.